All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, very different, definitely not weird, super not weird, but different Sunday morning. Um, if you are looking forward to music and a sense of normalcy with Andrew being back, I have great news for you. There's another Sunday coming seven days away. Uh, and at that time, you'll get what you want. Um, thanks for being here. Um, Let's dig in. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so uh, if you've got a Bible or an app, you can flip or scroll over to Matthew chapter 6. And while you're doing that, I have a question for you. Have you ever done anything in relationship with someone that you felt at that time was, was so bad, was so egregious, you thought, there's no way I can make it up to this person? That's it. That, that, that bridge has been burned. I have made that mistake, and that's it. That's all she wrote. Right? I, I know that I still have cringy things that keep me up at night because I remember, boy, that was a tremendously stupid thing to say to that person. Right? Not, not many of you had the august pleasure of knowing a young Joel McGinnis uh, <laughs> who, in his early 20s, said a lot of stupid things without thinking about them first and had very strong opinions and a very large chip on his shoulder. Uh, fewer still knew late 20s Joel or early 30s Joel or even mid 30s Joel who did kind of the same thing. Uh, and so I, I say all this knowing there are things that as a, a body of people we do and say to each other that Man, it's just so hard to pull that back. Uh, and in that moment, it can feel like there's just no way forward here. I, I've, I've burned the bridge. I've said the dumb thing. There is no hope for this relationship. The good news is that's just not how Christ's kingdom operates. That's right. Right? We've, been in, we've been in Matthew 6. We are in the apex of Christ's teaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? which is a a series of teachings starting in Matthew 5 going to Matthew 7 that is Jesus sitting down and saying, all right, guys, here's how this kingdom is going to work. The kingdom is here. It is now. It is imminent. It is in your midst. Here's how it's going to work. Christ's kingdom is different, right? Citizenship with Christ's kingdom has different rules. It has a set of rules that are often subversive and potentially even offensive to the other kingdoms around us. Praise God for that. And, and today's element of the Lord's Prayer has to do with forgiveness. Right? Jesus is, is teaching his disciples, here's how you pray. When you pray, pray this way. When you talk to the king, here's how you do that. Right? When you talk to the king, ask him to bring the kingdom. Display your eager desire for God to rule on earth the way that he does in heaven. Ask for that when you pray. When you pray, bring your very real needs to the king. Because the king very much wants to meet your physical needs. Well, today, Matthew 6, 12, Jesus, in teaching us how to pray teaches us to ask, Lord, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. All right, what's going on here? What, Jesus is using very particular language. He's talking about debts, right? I said the same thing last week. I, I promise when, when we think of debt, we think of a financial obligation. We're not talking about money this morning, so you can rest easy. You can put your wallets back, it's okay. Does Jesus mean debt or does he mean sin? Well, let, let, let's cheat a little bit. Um, you can flip over. In, in Luke 11, there is a very similar text, right? Jesus is uh, in the midst of teaching in, in what is often called the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, and the content is very, very similar. Jesus is, yet again, teaching his disciples, here is how you pray. And he says this in Luke 11, 4. Forgive us our sins... For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Right? So Jesus here in, in Luke, Luke records this. He seems to use those words interchangeably. Right? Now, there's lots of 
really nerdy, nuanced linguistic stuff that I will, I will not bore you with, I promise. Uh, but suffice it to say, there's an Aramaic loan word that's being used here that's interchangeable between the concept of sin and debt. Because that word understands that sin is a debt. That fundamentally, they are the same thing. Right? We have committed an offense either with each other or to the Lord that, like a debt, either has to be paid back or forgiven. Those are the two options. Debt is nothing more than an obligation to somebody, right? If somebody gives me a loan, I am then financially obligated to pay that back. If somebody does me a favor, you know, in, in, in colloquial parlance, we, we might say, all right, I owe you one, or I am now indebted to you, right? There is an obligation now between us. Make no mistake, let's make no mistake this morning, sin is what is in view here for Jesus. So when Jesus says in Matthew 6, 12, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, he is specifically talking about sin. Now here's, here's the good news, because what Jesus is saying is that in a kingdom economy, we do not trade in debts. Right In a kingdom economy where, where the, the citizens of the kingdom, the disciples of Jesus, are known by their love each, for, for each other, we know that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Right? So there's not somebody in a back room keeping a tally for everybody. And those debts, those obligations are then used to, manipula, to, to manipulate, like a chit that you call in when you need a favor. That's not how the kingdom works. The kingdom is about forgiveness. Now this is, I want to put it out there right at the beginning. This is kind of a touchy subject. Right? Forgiveness is one of those weird Christian topics where the moment somebody brings it up, everybody starts getting real defensive real quick. Right? In, in our heart of hearts, the moment somebody starts talking about the need to forgive people, immediately we go to, we, we think of somebody else and we think of all of the reasons that we cannot forgive that person. Joel, you don't know what they did. Joel, you don't understand how bad that was. You're like, you weren't there, man. You did not see what they did and how awful it was. No, I can't forgive them. All right. Let me free you up this morning. You're right. The nature of sin is that we wrong each other. We are a people, we are a group of humans, and we inevitably sin against each other. And that is wrong that we do that. So if you feel like you have been wronged by somebody in your life, you are probably right. So like, let me just call that out on the outset. You're, the feeling that you're feeling right now is on some level justified. But here's the big idea this morning. We need God's forgiveness just as much as we need to forgive each other. We need God's forgiveness just as much as we need to forgive each other. So let's, let's break this down. We're going to break it down into a couple of pieces. You guessed it, three pieces. Here's my first point this morning. Just as I said, we all need God's forgiveness. So let's, let's talk about that what that means. What does that actually mean? All right, we're going to start with the easy work, right? I think on some level, we all have a tacit understanding of the gospel. Yeah, everybody falls short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. God sent his son to die for us, and our sins were nailed to the cross and are no more, right? That's, that's, that's the gospel, right? And so we all recognize our own need for forgiveness to some extent. But Christ is modeling for us, if we stop and think about it, something that's very interesting, right? Christ is saying, as you pray, when you pray ask for forgiveness. Well, that, that should make us question to what degree do we actually need forgiveness? Because I thought the gospel says that when Jesus died for my sins, my sins are gone. I thought I have been forgiven under Christ. Why, Jesus, do I need to ask for forgiveness? I thought I was forgiven. 
we're already in the kingdom, right? So help me understand Jesus. So we're going to have to do a little bit of systematic theology this morning. Let's talk about justification, right? So this, is my, this is my shameless plug uh, for the Wednesday night Galatians group. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but we've been having a ton of fun meditating on Scripture together. Uh, and we have been specifically digging into, it's in the name, but the book of Galatians. And a major, major element of Paul's writing in that letter has to do with justification, right? And, and justification is a, is a, it's a legal term. It's a very specific term, which means if I go to court and I'm standing before a judge, the judge bangs the gavel, he looks at me and he says, in the eyes of the law, you are innocent, right? That's what it means to be justified. Now, we know, because we know the gospel, that we have our justification in Jesus. So let's uh, put a pin in in, in Matthew. If you want to flip over there, you can. But uh, Paul writes this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He says, You who were dead in your trespasses and by the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses, right? And a trespass is a specific word for sin that says, here's the line, you knowingly and willingly crossed it. That's what a trespass is. In the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. All right, so the good news for the Christian is the record of sin, all of the sin that you have committed, are committing right now, and will ever commit, that record, that legal record has been nailed to the cross. It is gone. It's done. It's, it is bye-bye. Amen. That's what it means to be justified. Jesus is not talking about justification, right? Jesus does not have this in mind, right? The New Testament writers seem to have no problem with the truth of the notion of justification here and also with the other hand holding on to the need for ongoing forgiveness in the life of the believer. All right, let me, let me prove it to you. 1 John chapter 1, right? John, disciple of Jesus, the disciple that Jesus loved, right? Hanging out with Jesus every day, wrote five books of the New Testament. Here is what he says. If we, right? John's using the first person plural, right? So he's putting himself in the same boat as the reader. If we say, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who's John writing to? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to the already justified So he is recognizing that even though we are justified, we obviously still sin. And there is a very real need in the life of the believer for the habit, the discipline, the attitude of confession. It's not the same as justification. But when we sin, we are still incurring a debt. And something has to happen with that debt. We sin, and and while we recognize that Christ's forgiveness is more than sufficient for our salvation, the kingdom citizen has never been about only doing what is required, about only meeting the bare minimum, right? I've been justified, I'm in the kingdom, I'm good, right? That's not a kingdom ethic. That's not a kingdom-minded citizen. A kingdom citizen says instead that I bear the responsibility for the health and well-being of this community. That I bear the responsibility for the success of this kingdom. 
A, a, a good kingdom citizen, a kingdom-minded, a, a kingdom ethic-driven believer recognizes that we all sin, we're all incurring debt with each other and with the Lord, and once incurred, then we are zealous in the pursuit of having that debt cleared. Because the gospel informs us that there should be no impediment between us. There should be nothing between me and a brother or sister. And so if I incur a debt, I am eager to remove that debt. Right? And this, this is the good news of the gospel again, right? The, you know, another shameless Galatians uh, night plug, right? There's a major problem with the law, with the covenant that came before Jesus, in that God set the standard, and there is nothing intrinsically true of the standard that was life-changing, sufficient, that it made people able to meet the standard, Right? The law could not empower people to keep the law. But through Christ and with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden we have new desires. And we can make the choice to be kingdom-minded. So Jesus says, when we pray, we ask God for our needs, right? We talk, we talk to God, Lord, I need this. I, I, have this. I have something coming up in my life and I don't know how I'm going to meet that need. I need you. In this case, instead of our physical needs, Jesus teaches us to ask about our chief spiritual need. For God to clear our debts. When we sin, there is an impediment between us and the Lord. We have incurred a debt. We have caused an inequity. And so Jesus teaches, ask for the Lord to forgive. And the good news, the gospel news is, he will then forgive. We have to ask for forgiveness. We, we need that forgiveness in our life. We all need an unimpeded relationship with the king. Number two, we also all need to forgive others. Right, look, we, yeah, I think we can all recognize, yes, absolutely, we need forgiveness. Yes, I recognize that sin is wrong and that I should confess that to the Lord, right? We all recognize that. That's part of repentance. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. And now we get to the spicy bit, which is, oh, you're telling me that because of that, I now have to forgive people that I don't want to forgive. Look, there, there are two sides to the coin of forgiveness. And this is where the hard work begins. This is where it starts to get uncomfortable. This is where we start to get defensive, you don't know what they did to me, Joel. Well, we need to forgive others because for forgiveness received cannot be contained. The magnitude, the, ma the magnificence of the forgiveness, the depth of the forgiveness that we have received from God through Jesus cannot be contained. If we truly understood what has been given to us, it changes us. And all of a sudden, again, in a kingdom economy, uh, forgiveness becomes, uh, it, sh it shifts from a commodity where we have to guard because it's limited. It shifts to something that in a kingdom economy we have, we possess through Christ without end. And so we have a surplus of forgiveness to share with all. So let me shift my language from the ought to the must. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, he says... Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you, right? Again, here's that direct relationship. Forgive people because Christ forgave you. Or forgive people in the way that Christ forgave you, without measure and without end. Paul writes in Colossians 3, similarly, but he uses a little bit different language. See if we can pick up on it. He says, Colossians 3, put on then as God's chosen ones, 
holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And here's, here comes the operant part. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, and here's, here comes the knockout punch, so you also must forgive. Must forgive. Look, the implication here should be clear to all of us that the Christian has no option but to be a grand source of forgiveness in the world. That we are miniature hubs of forgiveness walking around. That the magnitude of what Christ has done for us ekes out of our lives. Now, unfortunately... We, and I, and I don't just mean this specific to Anthem Church. I mean this to the, the modern church in general. We, we sometimes treat commands as suggestions. Some, sometimes we're kind of soft on things that Scripture isn't particularly soft on. All right, well, I know I'm supposed to forgive. I don't really want to forgive this person. It's not, it's not really that big of a deal if I don't, right? See, see, we treat the command like a suggestion, and then sometimes... We hide behind things, right? Okay, now I, I, I have in my notes, it specifically says here, be gentle, Joel, be nuanced. Um, <laughs> sometimes we hide behind our words like, you know, I'm just, I'm working on forgiving this person. You know, I'm working on doing X. I'm, 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 you know, I'm just working through what it means or what it looks like to forgive this person. I, I have really bad news for us. There's no such thing. There is no such thing. Like Forgiveness is not a Lego set that you buy. It's not like one of those little Frank Lloyd Wright Lego sets that has an instruction manual. You flip through it, you put pieces here. Maybe you go have a lunch break and you come back to it and you put some more pieces. That's not forgiveness. No, I'm not saying forgiving somebody isn't something you're going to have to do multiple times. But it is a singular choice. I forgive this person. I am going to choose to wipe the slate clean between us. Paul says we must forgive. Full stop. That's the command. All right, Joel. Well, to, to what degree? Right? There has to be some limitations. Well, oh, kind? Not really. Jesus and Simon, Jesus and Peter are having this very same conversation later in Matthew, chapter 18. Peter, Matthew records that Peter comes up to Jesus and he said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I must forgive him? As many as seven times? See, there's, there's, there's this thing in rabbinic teaching, in, in, in rabbinic tradition, in Jewish tradition, that when you forgive somebody, here's the rule. They get three times, right? The first three times somebody commits an offense, you forgive them. They are forgiven. It's clear. There's no debt between us. I forgive you. We're good. After three times, that's it. There is no more forgiveness. Right? That was the Jewish law. That was the Jewish rule. So Peter, either, okay, we want to be generous, right? Perhaps Peter is attempting to pick up on what Jesus is saying. And so he takes the number of what is in Jewish law, in Jewish tradition, he doubles it and then adds one. He's like, I, we should forgive them a lot, right? We should forgive them seven times. <laughs> Jesus, in his very Jesus way, says, nope, that's not it. Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, right? An incalculable number, right? There is no upper limit. If your brother sins against you, there is no amount of times after which you are no longer forgiven, right? And why? Why is that? Because Jesus doesn't treat us that way. There is, there is no time that I have to worry about going to Christ because I have messed up and I have to worry in my heart of hearts. Like, what if, what if this is one too many? Ooh, that was pretty bad. What if that's too big? Right? That's not how Christ treats us. 
Right? That is not the kind and quality of forgiveness that we receive under the gospel. And so we cannot take in one kind and quality of forgiveness and give out a different. Within the kingdom, there is just no concept of withholding forgiveness. Because we forgive with the measure that we are forgiven. Look, you can take the Bible, you can look at it, you can read it upside down, you can squeeze lemon juice on it. It's just not there. There's nothing in the Bible that gives us any leeway to choose to not forgive our brothers and sisters. It's just not there. hope is that we can see the goodness of that because the the way that we are to forgive each other is it's just a reflection of what christ has done and it should show us the magnitude of what he has forgiven us for we need forgiveness just as much as we need to forgive each other and we need to when we pray we need to ask for god's forgiveness When we pray, we need to actively forgive those who have sinned against us, number two. And number three this morning is Jesus has a warning for us, which is to beware an unforgiving heart. After the Lord's Prayer, there's a few blocks of text in in Matthew 6 which are, Just so helpful, where Jesus then expounds on all of the things that he just prayed for to help us understand them. Jesus gives his own footnotes, and it's awesome. So if we look down at verses 14 and 15, we see a very uncomfortable paradigm. Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Right? To, to, to put it into our common parlance this morning, if, if, if you don't forgive others their debts, your Father will not forgive your debts. Now, this is, should be very uncomfortable for us as as you know, modern American Christians, right? Because we have this, again, we have this dead set understanding that there is no condition for, uh, for our Father to forgive us, right? The condition was met in Christ. We have believed in Christ. There is no other condition outside of faith by which our sins are forgiven. But again, Jesus isn't talking about our justification. He's talking about our relationships, And so I think the best way to understand these two verses is to actually take all three verses together and understand them together. Verses 12, 14, and 15. And I think what Jesus is trying to communicate here is that God forgives the penitent person because the penitent person, God loves to forgive this person, is because they understand what it costs God to forgive them. And then they love to eagerly share that because they understand. Right? The forgiven, the forgiven person has really good motive to forgive because they understand what forgiveness is. And how can we expect God to forgive us, to clear a debt, if we're choosing to love the debt? Right? So let me, let, me, let me kind of thread this needle here. If we are withholding forgiveness, if we are choosing to hold on to an offense from somebody, that is sin. That is sin. Right? It, is, it is wrong of us. We are in the wrong when we choose to not forgive. How can we expect God to clear the debt if we don't want to let go of the debt if we are choosing in that moment to love the debt more than Christ that debt goes nowhere and so our father doesn't forgive us
perhaps, perhaps, the reason for this, the reason we do this is we have too little, too small a view of how much we have been forgiven. Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 7. I, I will confess that as I was preparing uh, this week, this, this parable has just stuck with me in, in a very uncomfortable way. Uh, but Jesus says this, Luke records, a, a certain money lender had two debtors. One, owned, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50, right? So we have two debts, one a couple million, one a couple thousand. When they could not pay the debt, he canceled the debt of both. Now Jesus asked, which one of them will love him more? So Simon answered, well, the one I suppose for whom the, the, he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, hey, good, good job, good job, Peter. You, you got one right this time, right? You've judged rightly, Jesus says. Then, turning towards the woman. All right, pause. What's going on here? So Jesus is at a dinner party with a bunch of super religious people and his disciples. And in breaks this woman who, from a place of contrition, from a place of brokenness over her sin, she comes to Jesus and is weeping so uncontrollably that she is bathing Jesus' feet in her tears and she's wiping his feet off with her hair. And she's got this very expensive perfume that she's using to anoint his feet. So Jesus turns toward this woman. He says to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You give me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. Here's the kicker. Here's the real kick in the teeth. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And so if all we see of our own sin, of our own transgressions with God and each other, it's very small, n not really a big deal, just kind of things here and there, our sin's not a big deal, then we are pathologically incapable of the kind of widespread, the kind of deep, forgiveness that the gospel calls us to because we don't even understand forgiveness we don't rightly recognize what christ has forgiven us for there's very real danger in an unforgiving heart jesus is warning us and showing us a truth if we understand how much we are forgiven then we are able to love accordingly. We are able to then forgive accordingly. Now here's the problem with, with refusing to give, right? Because it goes deeper than that. Right? The real danger in refusing to forgive each other is that it, it stunts our understanding of what Christ has done, right? It, it, it shows us that there's a problem in our understanding of our own sin, but it also allows a barrier to exist between us and the Lord or between each other. Right? It allows that barrier to sit. It allows that barrier to fester. And our prayers to God, our relationship with the Lord, and our relationships with each other are hindered. Forgiveness is the inverse. It's, it's the opposite of some particularly nasty things. So if we go back to Ephesians 4, I'm going to use the same verse, but I'm just going to widen our lens a little bit. I'm going to back up one verse. If you're curious, this is Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Paul writes, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Then he goes in, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as, Christ in God, as God in Christ forgave you. 
Paul is giving us a juxtaposition, right? He's giving us a, a paradigm whereby we can choose one of two things. We can choose to forgive our brothers and sisters as they sin against us, or instead, we can choose to be a bitter, angry people. Those are the two options, right? Because when we allow a debt to sit, when we love, our, the, the, when we love that debt, when we hold on to that debt between us as brothers and sisters, all that can ever breed is anger and bitterness and hatred over time. So we can choose to do that or we can choose to forgive. Right? When we run from one, we inevitably embrace the other. That is the danger of an unforgiving heart. Is if we're choosing to not forgive, we are embracing, we are choosing bitterness. We are choosing anger. We are choosing malice, which is this deep, fiery hatred. When you run from one, you embrace the other. Christ does not want that for his people. He, number one, he doesn't want our people to be defined by anger, bitterness, and hatred. He doesn't want us as a people to be defined that way. He wants us to be defined by our love. But more than that, if we don't choose forgiveness, we're choosing slavery. We are, we are choosing to enslave ourselves to that bitterness. And Christ wants our freedom. He wants to set us free from bitterness that transforms us into bitter people. We must constantly be on guard for unforgiving hearts among us. Right? Because... Look, we need God's forgiveness. We need to forgive each other. And we need to be on guard. So I've just got a couple thoughts as we close this morning. Number one, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. I know that this isn't easy. I recognize that when the New Testament, when Paul says, you must forgive, that that is a heavy burden. It can be a very difficult thing. That's understandable, right? Because you're right. I don't know what that person did to you. I don't know the magnitude of their offense. And so I recognize that that's an uphill battle, and it's a tough ask, and it's obnoxious to sit in a seat and be yelled at for somebody to forgive somebody, and they don't know how bad it is. I understand that. What I can tell you is that in in my own life, I've been a very bitter human. And I have let people's offenses drive me as a person. And I understand that forgiveness is the difficult choice. But it is a choice that we must make. I, again, it's, it's not a process, but we do have to recognize that it's, it's a choice that we make, and it is a choice that we may have to make again, repeatedly, right? We're going to wake up every day and have to remind ourselves, no, I chose to forgive that person. I know what they did. I'm, I still have to choose to forgive that person, right? No, it's not an ongoing process, but it may be an ongoing choice. Forgiveness is the cancellation of debt, but forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean you trust that person, right? We, we have, you know, there's the old slogan, forgive and forget, right? No, that's dumb. That's not wise, right? Wisdom says, yes, forgive the person, but don't forget. We choose to forgive them, and then we choose to allow trust to be rebuilt, Just because somebody has wronged you and you forgive them doesn't mean we automatically go back to trust, right? We can't forget. Otherwise, that's just sweeping junk under the rug and pretending that what happened, we're pretending like it didn't happen. And that's not wise. But it doesn't mean we trust them. It means that we rebuild the trust over time. Because again, otherwise... We're choosing bitterness, enmity, strife, and malice. 
Additionally, forgiving others, it, forgiving others is not just about them, right? My choice to forgive somebody isn't just about them, right? It's not about letting somebody else off the hook. That's not what forgiveness is. And sometimes we hold on to that debt. Sometimes we bear that grudge because we feel like if I forgive them, then it justifies what they did. I'm letting them off the hook. And that's just not true. Forgiveness is about us as well. I, I say this from a, a, a deep pastoral love. Like, I, I don't want us as a people to be enslaved to this debt debtor relationship where all we can think of is how that person wronged us and how they need to make it up to us. That's not freedom. And hurting a grudge only hurts me. Right? If I have wronged somebody and they're holding a grudge against me, I'm over here doing my life. I'm not even thinking about you. Now, that's probably sin in and of itself, but that's a different sermon. The, the, the point is, if that person's holding a grudge, that grudge owns them. I'm fine. They're only hurting themselves. Holding a grudge only hurts you. And lastly... Do you want to talk about restitution? Look, if, if you have wronged somebody, if I have wronged somebody, we should desire to recognize that we've created an inequity between each other, and we should earnestly, honestly desire to remove that inequity. Paul says in elsewhere in Ephesians that the thief should no longer steal, right? You used to be a thief. You come to Jesus. Now, instead of stealing things, you work hard so that you can contribute. This isn't just about making it up to other people, right? Because love doesn't keep a record of wrong. This is about buying into the positive system that Christ has instituted. This is about buying into kingdom ethics, this is, about, this is what it looks like to seek the kingdom first, right? I can serve my own grudge. I can, I can call in debts to serve myself. Or I can seek the kingdom first and forgive my debtors. And this is, it may not sound like it, but this is, that's where the joy is. Because right? I want to live in that community. I want to live in a community where we're all looking at each other and seeing an object of forgiveness instead of an object of my offense. That's real joy. I want to live in that community where forgiveness is like water. Where I don't have to worry about my inevitable offense destroying everything because under Christ there is forgiveness for each other. I want to live in that community. That's the joy of the gospel. That is what Christ wants for us. That is the freedom that Christ has presented to us in his kingdom. And so here's how we get it. When we pray, as we pray, we ask the Lord, Lord, forgive me my debts. As we pray, when we pray, we take that time and we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts, Lord, as we also forgive our debtors. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would be convicting us this morning. Lord, would you show us people that we have wronged? Lord, would you highlight areas in our life where we have wronged others, where we have wronged you? Lord, would you show them to us? Would your spirit reveal them to us, convict us that we might repent, that we might make restitution, that we might seek forgiveness and in so do live in an unbroken community? Lord, would you help us to do that this morning? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you have engineered your kingdom to work so differently than these petty 
earthly man-made kingdoms. Lord, please bring your kingdom. Lord, please rule on earth the way that you do in heaven. Father, would you meet our needs? And Lord, would you forgive us and help us to forgive our brothers and sisters? I ask for these things in your name. Amen.